Bonjour à tous et toutes de nouveau. Hello again! C'est l'heure du troisième et dernier panel de la journée qui se tient dans le cadre de la table ronde régionale American, Amérique du Nord de l'UNEP-FI. It's time for today's third and last panel, which is held as part as UNEP-FI Regional Roundtable North America. Daniel Bouzas, Europe Regional Coordinator at UNEP-FI, will be our moderator here. Cette fois, nous parlerons de taxonomie et de cadre réglementaire en lien avec le climat. We will discuss climate policy frameworks and taxonomies. Bonne session. Hi, and welcome to this uh, session of the Steel Finance Summit uh, about well, from the UNEPFI uh, North America. Thank you for joining us and uh, happy to see that we have already all of the speakers with us. I'm Daniel Bothers, I'm the European Regional Coordinator for Europe at UNEPFI, and I will be the moderator of today's session. I'm very happy to present our speakers for this panel on aligning climate policy frameworks and taxonomies. I'm happy to be joined by Peter Johnson, the chair of the Canadian Standards Association Technical Committees working on the taxonomy. Hi, Peter. Uh, we have also Karen de Gouff, the head of sustainable business development at Natixis, uh, bank, uh, French bank, part of the group BPC, and Denisa Avermaete, that is the senior advisor at the European Banking Federation on sustainable finance and chair of the environmental concerns working group at the International Banking Federation. And thank you very much uh, all for joining me today and So, uh, of course, I will just now give you a brief introduction before we go directly to the questions of the panelists of why are we having this discussion uh, today about taxonomies? What are the taxonomies? Why do we need this uh, alignment uh, in, in order to, to push sustainable finance forward? So, global financial markets have really the potential to bridge the sustainability gap by linking financial needs to global sources of fund, especially not only in the developed countries, but also in the developing countries. But this task, and upscaling, uh, scaling up stable finance is difficult because there's a lack of a coherent definition of sustainable investments or sustainable finance as a whole. And there's a low degree of standardization of transparency on what does environmental or sustainable finance or green finance actually means. Markets in that regard need the guidance to steer capital flows into a direction that is proven to be sustainable, that is properly defined. And Several jurisdictions around the world have started to draw up roadmaps on how to do this, how to promote sustainable finance by introducing, in some cases, regulatory frameworks focused on sustainability or to standardize specific areas of knowledge that can be uh, used in order to define sustainability. For example, China has led the way in developing green taxonomies for different financial products, notably green bonds and loans. Uh, the EU as well is finalizing now the EU uh, taxonomy which is quite encompassing, looking into uh, substantial contribution of an activity, do not significant harm and other elements. While Canada, that we have, of course, represented here by, by, by Peter, is exploring a possible green taxonomy uh, to work together with other stable finance. Others around the globe have, have also started to look into this, for example, in Russia, Singapore or the UK. Uh, in 2019, the International Platform of Stable Finance was launched by the European Commission and its uh, international partners, looking into understanding how to really uh, push forward this agenda. Right now, it's composed by 14 member jurisdictions representing around 50% of global greenhouse gas emissions, 50% of world population, and almost 50% of GDP. And the platform is exploring together with all of these jurisdictions uh, how to go forward in order to create common tools that could be useful for the private sector to make this shift. And that's a very critical way of how to explore this. Sustainable finance, given this lack of information, is a perfect example of imperfect information in the market that needs to be bridged. In order to get that more perfect information, public sector uh, tools may be the ones that can push forward or bring more clarity to the market. Uh, in addition, in Europe, again, 
bring it back to the Europeans, which uh, we have quite a lot in this panel today. Uh, we have already started seeing how the financial industry is looking into these public initiatives and trying to push them forward. The PRI, uh, Taxonomies Practitioner Group, uh, released conclusions on how to apply the EU taxonomy to specific products last year. And as well as we have done from UNEPFI together with the European Banking Federation, uh, piloting the EU taxonomy on several banking products. And we are also working towards further development this year. Uh, of course, in Canada, and especially now in North America, that we're, uh, is the region we're looking into, financial markets have been working on that made in Canada approach. There is more of a financial markets helping to create the public good. I will let Peter explore a bit more uh, on that. Uh, how this high level profit, this classification system could work in order to make the standards uh, from the CSA work, creating this green taxonomy at, at the Canadian. So I hope that this introduction more or less sets a bit the scene of how uh, these different jurisdictions are looking into defining what is sustainable in order to provide more perfect information to the market and how approaches from the public sector or the private sector are actually taken up by one another and combining in order to really generate something that is usable for, for the market. So in this session, we will explore the status of the taxonomy developing globally and the key principle for international collaboration. We'll highlight the need how to work for a, a common global language around sustainability to guide our economies towards further uh, sustainability and global recovery efforts. So thank you very much for, for joining us. And I, I would like to already start the first question uh, to all of the panelists, um, that is, what are the key trends that you see on taxonomy development globally on top of what I presented? And what are the key steps in uh, key jurisdictions such as Europe and Canada? And if you can also tackle the issue about why do you think some specificities may be necessary at jurisdictional level that may justify to have a different taxonomy like Canada, Europe, Russia, China, or is, necess is it necessary to have a scientific uh, global approach to taxonomies? And I would like first to turn to Denisa, if you could please uh, take uh, this question. Thank you. Ask about the trends, actually, I, I would think that the actual trend is the development of local taxonomies. We see this, uh, for example, in China, in Canada, and Peter will talk about that. In, uh, there are also considerations in Japan, in Australia, India, UK, also US, uh, in addition to the taxonomy that EU already has. I would say that while countries are looking at each other's fingers, um, the national government seems to prefer to keep autonomy and to consider the best way forward for their own jurisdiction. Um, for example, UK announced the creation of its own taxonomy. They said they will base it uh, on the scientific metrics of the EU taxonomy, but with inevitable divergence. Huh? And other jurisdictions, um, I'm now talking about uh, from also the IBFED perspective a little bit, uh, they are also looking at the EU taxonomy and how this can be customized to other economies, of course. Well, at the same time, there is indeed the international platform, you mentioned that already, um, that is working on a common ground taxonomy. So there is clearly also a desire to bring comparability and consistency at global level. Um, I believe the G20 could play an important role in this, the harmonization efforts. At this stage, however, it seems that it's moving a little bit um, step by step. Um, they are actually looking at using the same languages across taxonomy, using the same or easily comparable industrial codes. They are um, looking at minimum, establishing some kind of minimum standards, uh, designing tools to allow for comparability. Well, at least in the short term, this seems to be the preferred uh, approach. Um, for Europe, of course, we are a little bit um, probably ahead. Uh, we already have the taxonomy the so-called green taxonomy for climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. So this is already defined and companies and financial market participants are going to be obliged to report the extent to which their activities are compliant with the EU taxonomy. So it's not only the trans so transparency tool for those who want, but there's also a mandatory, um, mandatory tool against which to report. Um, now, with the help of a platform for sustainable finance, this is a large uh, body, uh, advisory body to the European Commission that consists of private sector, public sector and uh, civil society. They are developing technical screening criteria for the remaining environmental objectives, so for biodiversity, for circular economy, uh, water and um, pollution prevention. This is expected to be finalized uh, next year. The Commission, the European Commission, is also preparing a report on the need to complement the green taxonomy or extent with the taxonomy for harmful 
environmental activities and also activities that do not have any significant environmental impact. There will be also a report on the social taxonomy. On the ESG, the governance, they are not preparing anything that's part of basically any taxonomy, the proper, um, proper governance. Um, on top of that, there will be consideration on options for extension of the taxonomy to the activities that are transitioning on a credible uh, pathway. And from banking perspective, I would like to say this is probably the most important aspect. Um, we do believe that there is a need to complement the current taxonomy, so not to change the green taxonomy, because it's, it's important that there are actually um, credible and scientific based um, uh, thresholds, but to complement to uh, with an approach which will allow the assessment of a company alignment with net zero 2050 objectives. So the green taxonomy to be complemented with something like greening or uh, people call it also like transitioning taxonomy or transitionally aligned. Um, uh, so I would like to I would like just just say that this complementary uh, approach to the current taxonomy uh, should indeed not only define what is green but also to provide this additional forward-looking element, forward-looking dimension that will be define what is what is greening. Uh, there are also a few topics that you still has to address. Some difficult topics, such as inclusion or not of nuclear or gas as a transitioning um, energy in the green taxonomy, or development the technical screening criteria for the agriculture. These were left out of the taxonomy and still will be addressed uh, later um, this year. And maybe just very briefly to address, um, you were asking whether there is a room for uh, any like um, accents uh, or um, local local um, taxonomies uh, if something is scientifically based. So of course it seems intuitively intuitive that a purely scientific approach would not allow for any national or regional tweaks. Uh, but also we have to understand that different jurisdictions are a different starting point. Huh? Um, so by the EU taxonomy is principle science based, uh, and it also um, defines activities that can be considered environment sustainable. So activities, not products, not uh, companies. Um, they have to significantly contribute to one of the environmental objectives. And, um, um, and, and, and we are talking about 2050 and one and a half degrees. So maybe if you look at China, for example, they are talking about 2060. So there might be, I, I, I don't know exactly where, where these differences are. Uh, that they might be already differences coming from this computation, but also I think it, the differences may come to um, how much of this transitioning or this greening you allow into your green taxonomy. Thank you. Thank you, Anissa. I think that that's a very uh, comprehensive response and I, and I do see the duality between let's say, uh, the, the specificities and the, the global approach. And of course, this will need to come in the way forward more, more clear. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, Peter, what is your, your take on this? Where are the, the key elements of how you see the development in Canada and how you have tried to address this challenge? Thank you, Daniel. Um, and thank you to UNEPFI and the organizers for the opportunity to be a part of this panel. Um, it's an incredibly important topic um, and with the people, colleagues that are on this panel, I think we're all going to be raising the importance of this. So thank you for bringing this topic forward. And I'd like to just start by picking up one of the concepts that Denisa raised, and that is timing. Um, you know, the Europeans have been very advanced on this topic for well over a decade, if not longer, um, and have done some tremendous, fantastic work and continue to do that. Um, where we are in Canada right now, I just wanted to sort of take a step back to sort of why we started this process. So back in 2019, we had a an expert panel on sustainable finance within Canada. And one of the topics that they raised was the topic of transition. Um, and just given the realities of Canada's economy and our society and our dependence upon natural resources, both historically for the past 400 years um, and currently as well, um, we have a, a bit of a unique economy and society that is different than other parts of the world. And so one of the recommendations of our expert panel was that we needed to start to think about transition. Um, you know, green is well established and the Europeans have done great work on green and social is becoming more and more established and ESG is becoming established. But the piece in the middle that Canada is most, I would say, vulnerable to um, but also sees as one of the big opportunities is transition. And so we started a project two years ago to start to define what transition means 
And that's our sole focus is transition. And it's even more narrowly focused in that our scope is the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. So we recognize there's lots of other sort of environmental topics and social topics and ESG topics that need to be addressed and will be addressed over time. But in order to achieve a starting point, we kept a very, very narrow focus on the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we started, you know, it is a group of volunteers that have come together from the private sector to put our, our heads and experience together on developing a taxonomy that would help to mobilize capital, both Canadian capital, but also international capital to begin the transition. And we've been working on this document for, for two years now. We cover specifically eight sectors, um, our very heavily based natural resource sectors, as you can imagine. Um, and our document is focused on really two areas. One is principles. So we've got a, a set of principles that we believe would be internationally accepted, would be globally accepted based on what has already been published by different organizations. Um, and we share a very common view on two core elements. One is alignment with the Paris Agreement. Um, and then the other is using science to be able to develop trajectories and pathways and milestones in order to achieve transition. So it's really that, um, you know, we all have this common destination, but there's going to be many, many different routes that we're going to have to follow to be able to get to that destination. And so the group that we're working with now, um, we're continuing, we're, we're getting close. We're hoping that we will have a completed document by the end of this calendar year um, that we then would be able to put out into the marketplace to be able to you know, start to get experience, to learn from it, and really to start to mobilize capital. I just also need to be you know, pretty specific that we are not representing the government of Canada. And so it's a bit of a bit of a misnomer when we say this is Canada's taxonomy. We don't have a mandate from the government of Canada, and we certainly do not have representation from all of civil society or from all of the respective groups that need to be involved in this over time. Um, to be perfectly honest, we are a bunch of people from the financial sector um, working with a bunch of people from industry sectors trying to put together something that is nationally coherent and would be internationally accepted and credible. We see this as a, a first step. We know that there is going to have to be step two and three and four. We're going to have to learn from experience as we go through. And we're also going to have to learn by connecting internationally as well. We've had lots of good discussions with various countries and geographies around the world. We also watch everything that gets published. You know, there's almost something new being published almost every month, if not more frequently on this topic. Um, but transition is something that is critical to Canada's economy and society. So we wanted to be able to contribute to that discussion and that dialogue. But again, it is that common destination that we all share. And that is the Paris Agreement, net zero by 2050, if not earlier. And then those periodic milestones, very, very strong disclosures and clarity and using science to guide the direction for transition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And I do see here that there's uh, a topic rising that is, of course, the topic of, of transition, because we see uh, what Denisa was commenting that, you know, we see here two different approaches on the topic of transition, because transition now in the UTEX from in the beginning, it didn't appear to be as clearly specified. There was a specific transitioning activities that could be considered, but now also in the renewed system of finance strategy of uh, the commission, we see that the transition is the focus. And also the approach that in the EU it has been a regulatory approach that then consulted the industry to understand what to include and what should the taxonomy be, and the opposite way in Canada, there's more the financial industry came together. And in this case, you know, I would really like to understand what is the perspective of a bank, of an Atixis in this case, on this whole process to understand what do you think is the best way forward, how can you support this transition, and where does the taxonomy lay in terms of the the development that has been happening in Europe and Canada, and is it useful to have this distinction or a global effort should be really connected in order to bring this, let's say, these efforts uh, forward? 
Thank you, Daniel. I was going to ask uh, Peter if his uh, 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 himself and and the bunch of uh, of bankers uh, uh, working with him could not advise the European uh, Commission um, because transition is definitely what we need. We've been. I mean, this is a subject which is really dear to me. I, I think we're we're missing the point. I've said it several times. We're missing the point if we only address pure green business only. And um, um, this being said, the European Commission is taking the right way by adding the, um, we, we call it amongst ourselves the brown taxonomy, but it should not be brown. It should be about transition only. How do we make sure that we address and that we have a taxonomy to measure trans transition pathways? And this is definitely the way forward. Um, today, environment, uh, environmental and pure green taxonomies are still the most common. Um, and for, for Europe in particular, but all the taxonomies that we see being uh, developed uh, around the globe, and there are actually uh, a lot. Uh, I've counted 15 only on the green side, not talking about the social ones. I mean, in jurisdictions as, uh, as diverse as Chile, Mexico, Georgia, Singapore, South Africa, Bangladesh, Malaysia, you have taxonomies emerging for sustainable uh, activities. Um, there are a different stage of adoption, um, but, and, and a lot of the uh, uh, social and transition themes are gaining momentum as well on top of, uh, of just the, the, the green business. Um, we are witnessing an overall standard setting race, I, th I think. I mean, Europe was definitely leading uh, a couple of years ago, but that's probably less and less the case. Um, and in that standard set, st setting race, um, taxonomies as classification tools um, provide the bedrock of uh, product integrity and quality. Um, so there is, a, we can see that race happening at the moment. Um, many countries have adapted the EU taxonomy criteria, but some others develop taxonomies to set themselves as sustainable finance uh, for runners, that's the case for the UK, I think, and to some extent Singapore, or to lead um, criteria um, development in very specific sectors. Um, one example that I can give uh, that, that I know a little bit is mining in Chile, for example. There's a taxonomy being developed in Chile where uh, focused on, on mining, and that's probably something that, uh, that you're aware of uh, in, in, the, in, in the work that you're doing in Canada. Um, I think coordinating and harmonizing those taxonomies is both a challenge and a necessity. Um, companies are not yet equipped to align to different or even discrepant taxonomies. Um, this is not going to happen. I mean, even one is going to be complicated. So if we have a, a multitude of taxonomies, it will just be impossible. And I'm not just talking about financial institutions. Um, global actors, we're a global bank. Uh, we need to have a standard that is harmonized across the different jurisdictions where we have clients and where we do business. Um, so um, in your question, Daniel, around uh, specificities versus a global approach, I would definitely favor the global approach. Uh, where we, what we can have is in a global taxonomy, we can have specificities country by country. Uh, as we have sector by sector, but this needs to be harmonized. It should not be country X that developed the taxonomy that applies to business in country X, but it should be a global taxonomy harmonized between what we have, you know, what has been developed across the globe to address and to have uh, specificities for each country, but uh, in a global approach. And then that's why I'm going back to my initial comment that I think that Canada should definitely contribute to the European work on transition. That would be probably very interesting and very useful. Thank you. Thank you, Karin. And I really pick up this uh, these elements here. I will I will turn to Peter just in a moment also to see how he responds to your to your to your request. But uh, I would like to to just I'm not the European from... Commission. So. No, <laughs> I'm not recruiting him. <laughs> of course, no. But I would like to understand if here if we didn't have uh, at some point um, a missed opportunity because in many cases uh, we see that the taxonomies are being built upon systems that are already existing that in some cases are coming from 
uh, global standard that was disaggregated in order to be able to be applicable at, uh, uh, let's say, in different jurisdictions. Because in many cases, NACE codes or uh, the Chinese industry codes are, let's say, all coming from ISIC, which is already a global uh, nomenclature in terms of uh, industry classifications. And then regional specificities were depicted in order to bring it more to the reality of the country. So putting a taxonomy at global level already could you know, possibly be feasible if everybody would agree that, okay, we use it from that moment and then uh, the specificities come afterwards. But in any case, this would still be op operable in the future if that would happen. So there's a still a possibility of this happening or if uh, ISSB in the future, the International Stability Standards Board, actually effectively starts also working in this direction. But those are more questions for the future and the past. But now I would like to, to turn to, uh, to Peter to really understand, okay, what do you think then of the specificities of the Canadian approach of the industry? What has been the, the key elements brought forward? What are the timelines that you also have in front of you and the main challenges that you have for the industrial makeup? I mean, I can also imagine that if a group of experts as such um, you know, would be put in Europe, the industry mix would be different. So I would like to know a bit more. And how are you trying to connect globally? Are you also going that extra step and trying to understand how to align or what are your views from, from Canada? Thank you, Daniel. Um, and I'd just like to pick up on that previous comment about the globalization and the need to share. Um, right at the outset, when we established our work in Canada, um, we made it very clear both within and internationally, that we want to be um, contributing, we want to be learning, we want to be sharing. Um, we are far too small of a country and an economy to pretend that we're going to be developing the global standard around transition. Um, we do feel as if we can have something to contribute, um, but we want to be able to contribute you know, globally because I think we all agree that there does need to be some global direction and some global standardization around these topics. We've, you know, there's a rich history of standardization around the world since the end of World War II um, from various sectors to address various problems. Um, and so we're really working just to be able to put the Canadian contribution to that, um, recognizing that there are many, many other countries and experts that need to come together on this topic as well. Um, so, you know, the way that we're addressing it in Canada is that we are really bringing together three types of organizations that we think are essential for transition to work. Um, one is the investors. Because if we don't have the investors having confidence in what we're building, then that's going to be a shortcoming. Um, we're also bringing together the banks so that if the banks are able to bring a company to market or to present a company or a transition initiative to the investors, there needs to be that confidence in the project. Uh, and then the other side of it, we will call you know the issuers or the industry side of it, and they need to be contributing as well because they need to be able to provide that balance about what's realistic from an operational point of view and a practical point of view. Because they have, you know, a lot of these industries in the natural resource-based sector, they've started transition. They've been thinking about, you know, carbon disclosures for, for many, many years, but they still have work ahead of them. So this is why we believe that we need to have these three discussions, uh, three parties coming together to have this discussion so that we can create something that's practical and workable. And it may not solve all of the problems within the first couple of years, but it's going to be that step forward and that we can learn from it so that the next step forward is going to be even stronger. So we see this very much as a building block. And while this is going on within Canada, we're able to contribute and learn uh, from what's going on in other parts of the world and working towards global standardization. So Canada is very actively involved in the um, International Sustainable Platform. Um, we're working with the ISO Technical Committee on Sustainable Finance. So we are connecting in and we've had lots of discussions with some of the folks from the EU and from other countries and other taxonomies. So it is going to be this sort of open communication and sharing. And, you know, going to the earlier comment about sort of this global race towards standardization. Um, and, I, and I think in two ways, it's, it's really good that that's happening because we're getting really smart people to think about really tough questions. But I think it's also that recognition that there is right now 
not a document or taxonomy that is one size fits all, that it is going to be essential for these national and international connections to be made um, and that these conversations and then how do we find that global platform whether it is through iso whether it is through the eu what we don't know sort of where that platform is going to be maybe something will come out of cop 26 who knows um, but we need to continue to build the conversation um, and and keep it practical and workable because one of the things that we're also finding is that you know, you literally can spend years chasing perfection. And if you spend that time chasing perfection, A, you're never going to achieve perfection, but you're also losing time when change should be happening. So this is one of our biggest motivators is that we've got to get the capital mobilized. We've got to get this process started and that we don't let ourselves get caught up in chasing perfection. Um, but that we set up a process that is credible, it's got a really sound foundation, and then we implement and we learn from it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think uh, your last words are very, you know, punching the way that we need to act, you know, this really to shake the industry forward. And I would like to turn here to Karen to really, you know, I understand that Natixis has at some point also used this approach. You know, we have developed the, the green weighting factor and other ways of looking into sustainability in the way forward. And I would like to know if you could provide to the audience with a European bank perspective of how do you see this working in, in the way forward? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it was our motivation when we started developing that uh, initiative, internal initiative known as the green weighting factor, was really exactly what Peter just mentioned, get things started, start somewhere, even if it was small, even if, even if it was imperfect, um, uh, get, get, get to action, start, stop talking, stop complaining about data not being available and so on, and, and do something. So we've indeed built that mechanism that links um, analytical capital allocation to the degree of sustainability of what, what we finance, what we as a bank on our balance sheet. Um, and, and so by you know developing that, we needed to develop a, met a methodology. So um, basically a taxonomy before it was called like this, um, to actually classify or to measure the, uh, uh, the, 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 the degree of sustainability of our financing. Um, and and there, there wasn't any taxonomy at the time, so we developed our, our, own, our own thing. Um, and, and basically, we faced several issues, which we're still facing today when we're looking at how we will ultimately implement the European taxonomy. Um, data is clearly an issue. Uh, we've mentioned that number of times and it was one of the the, the outcome of the 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 unfi ebf report uh, that was published uh, uh, earlier this year or at the end of last year i can't remember so data collection is is really is really a topic uh, that that is complicated so when you and and it will continue to be uh, for the for the next uh, few years i mean uh, um, uh, taxonomy use cases obviously include disclosure requirements uh, for corporates and financial entities and data collection by companies to evaluate their activities against any taxonomy is demanding and it will continue to be. Disclosure requirements will uh, demand significant uh, uh, information system changes uh, for, for, for corporates and for the banks. Um, auditing new skills from staff uh, because you don't, the, I mean, the last thing we need is is only a, a group of sustainable finance experts being able to use the taxonomy and evaluate things against a, a, an existing taxonomy. So training people, uh, um, uh, IT systems uh, reshuffle and, and and so on will be will be necessary. So at the end of the day, despite all those issues, um, we have. I strongly believe that a good taxonomy needs to find, and that's what the European taxonomy is trying to do, needs to find the right balance between being comprehensive um, in terms of sectoral coverage, uh, the scope of activities and so on. Sophistication, because um, it, it, you know, if it's too sophisticated, we won't be able to use it. So we need to find the right degree of sophistication uh, of the taxonomy itself. Um, it's usability, again, uh, you know, the nature 
and complexity of the uh, verification process, for example, uh, the data input availability and so on. Are, is what we're building really usable? I still have doubts with what has, uh, you know, what has been produced by, by Europe so far. Uh, it's still, we still need to prove that it's usable as it stands today. Um, and finally, the degree of stringency. So uh, basically, uh, and this is the whole complexity of those mechanisms. We need to find the, the right balance between com comprehensiveness, sophistication, usability, and stringency. And and we, I'm not saying that any of the existing taxonomies around there has met all those four criteria, but this is the, the balance that we need to we need to try to find. And this is exactly what we've tried to do at our own small level when we develop the the green weighting factor methodology. And, and again, I agree that we need to start somewhere. It may be small, it may be imperfect, but it needs to be usable absolutely usable and this is one of probably one of the major outcome of the the report that we released earlier that was uh, tested by uh, a country member Denisa you would remember that how many banks <laughs> it's more than 25 indeed more than yeah. 25 there who tested the European taxonomy and the, the outcome was that it's partially usable but we're not there yet so uh, and this is the major this is probably the major concern today so my recommendation would be you know, it, it needs to be stringent, it, it needs to be somehow sophisticated, comprehensive, but it needs probably more than anything usable. Thank you very much, Karen. I think, you know, very, uh, you know, clear uh, wording of what are the the, the areas to, to tackle. And I would like to just, you know, mirroring your words, turn to Denisa and ask also from, you know, your real hat, the DBF, IBFED, how, how do you see the way forward in, you know, bridging these challenges or understanding what is the right level of uh, comprehensiveness, sophistication, the usability, and how you have been tackling it from the banking associations, because all of the members that are pulling together in the discussions that you have internally have different views, but you need to agglutinate and put them together in something that is coherent, and at the same time to collaborate and discuss with the public sector and those that will implement it in the regulation. So I would like to, to see what is your perspective in terms of that balance and the way forward in order to make the transition a reality in the collaboration between par uh, the private sector itself and the private and public sector. Thanks, Daniel. Um, just to manage expectations, I don't have really the solutions, <laughs> despite that we tested it with 25 banks. Of course, the, the idea was also to point out where actually we can further cooperate with public sector, what can be improved and so on. Um, just, to, just to say before before I go into some of them and without repeating what, um, what Peter and Karen already said, and I fully agree, I also had the same reflection uh, as Karen when uh, I heard Peter speak, speaking, you know, Europe may be ahead with the green taxonomies, but actually we can learn a lot about this transition uh, taxonomy concept. You may be the first jurisdiction to have something comprehensive um, in, a, in place. But basically this cooperation and global cooperation is, is really key. Now, when I put on the IBFED hat a little bit uh, before I talk, talk about that, uh, there is a trend of having local taxonomies. But also when you when when you listen to the discussions, there is really a push and call for um, IBFED members, uh, the International Banking Federation, to have harmonization and standardization, uh, to, to have common understanding of key concepts and promote also consistency and comparability. Um, there is also broad support for the disclosure uh, and the um, um, International Sustainability Standards uh, Board. That would have to be underpinned by common definition. You cannot just have disclosures without having common understanding of the of the concept so now when you when you ask what would we or may need from the public sectors of course the cooperation um, sometimes you say it's it takes two to tango i would say it takes actually um many more people to tango here uh public sector private investors bankers uh, industry all needs to be uh, in the same room but from legislators and regulators in particular um, we need further clarity on this possible comparability. So, for example, some uh, practically when speaking, and this was also the findings of the project, like some conversion tables, mapping local standards to international ones, as well as mapping taxonomies with pre-existing frameworks that are commonly used by the industry, at least in the period before we have something, you know, um, uh, something perfect uh, at, at some point in uh, time. This will really uh, make the operational application a little bit um, less burdensome. Um, when you ask about what are the key hurdles, 
um, so everyone will point to data huh? and it will be data availability, reliability, relevance and comparability. So basically what we were also saying that it would be very helpful uh, because sometimes people are saying the data are there there somewhere. So we would need some centralized public electronic registers for this data, um, maybe uh, centralizing the certification and labels, um, such as, for example, in Europe, you have the energy performance certificates, a CO2 emission databases by business activity, product types. This could be also very useful. And also, like, we should also think of how to utilize maybe the uh, artificial uh, intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, satellite data. This all can be useful, but it's something that is absolutely inefficient if you have to uh, do that at the entity level, probably not even possible. So when, when you also say, and very quickly, because it was mentioned the transition, transition, and always uh, back to um, transition, it's indeed the key. I mean, it's it's good to invest in, in green or already green uh, or to be green very soon, but actually where we need to really invest is make to the to make the um, uh, heavy industry, the manufacturing, the agriculture actually transitioning. Um, these are the sectors that need sustainable finance. It's, um, so that therefore we need regulatory framework that will not only support the green, but really also support to uh, to the screening and really it's also as as we are talking about like avoiding the greenwashing this is um without uh, greening washing or something but uh we really need the banks for example they need to understand whether a company is on credible path to transition how do you do that uh so you, you need like some kind of official underlying transition path like credible sectoral roadmap against which a company's transition uh, can be assessed um so we need some framework that would set at least minimum some criteria uh, that would be related to the scenario that could be used by corporates in specific sectors. And then you can assess the trajectory and see the corporate is on the right uh, path that you can call this a uh, transitioning uh, finance. So this forward looking information is it's basically really key, should be part of the disclosure framework. And again, I would stress this has to be credible. So it's not like an insignificant significant improvement. It still has to be um, um, a significant improvement on the on, uh, in the transitioning. Um, that would be that would be probably to add. I think uh, both Karen and Peter um, already touched upon that, so that um, I would not go into more details. I don't think even we have time, but. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Lisa. I think we still have uh, some time around 10 minutes so we can and now I would really like to, to go. I mean, we, we have covered a lot of things and, you know, a topic that seemingly may, you know, may look technical as, you know, is the taxonomy development and how these things move forward. In the end, it's really touching on the core of what is sustainability and what is sustainable finance and the transition to net zero. So in that regard, I would really like to, to have now quickly your views, like two, three minutes each on what do you think really uh, can we expect from the from the way forward and how to really reach that global cooperation because we see what is necessary in each of the jurisdictions we see what is necessary for the industry and what the public sector or the private sector can provide so what is lacking what is the the next step you know talking about forward-looking information what is your forward-looking uh, let's say advice on, on what to do that, that's what I would like to have. And uh, please, Peter, uh, go ahead. Um, great question. And I would put it, frame it in sort of in two ways. Um, one is don't underestimate companies um, because companies have been working on this topic um, for a very, very long time. And they have had really good financial disclosures. They're going through a learning process. They're going through a learning phase but they do know certainly what the key topics are, what the key issues are, what the regulatory requirements are around good environmental and social management and governance. The other component is um, don't underestimate, but we also have to be aware of markets. You know, markets are moving in this area as well. And if we don't start to provide some of these standardized tools to the market, um, then the two, then the market's going to start to create them for themselves. We've seen that there's a lot of activity moving around. You know, green bonds have been around for a long time, um, and now we start to look at sustainability-linked bonds and the SLBs and these types of things. So new tools are being created and implemented in the marketplace, and this I think is going to really start to mobilize and drive. So um, again, I go back to that concept that we cannot wait for perfection. We've got to start moving and collaboration nationally and internationally. 
you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I would like to, to ask uh, quickly just some points from, from uh, Karen and then Denise. Yeah, on the same question, uh, Daniela, I, I, I think if we if we manage to achieve uh, covering transition, which is really, to me, is really key, not to focus simply on the, I mean, or exclusively on the pure green or the pure sustainable already, um, then taxonomy alignment disclosure will not be perceived as a, a reporting burden as it is today, uh, uh, but it, uh, but rather as a as a tool to steer companies' uh, transition business models. Um, and, and, I, and I totally agree that uh, we should not underestimate the market and, and companies who will build uh, their own tools if they're not provided. Uh, but we might as well you know, work collectively to, to harmonize those tools because otherwise we will, uh, we will miss the point of, uh, again, of harmonization, which is needed by, by the you know, by the market globally when you're a global actor. One other thing that I want to mention is that we all, what we also need is to make sure that taxonomies, whichever they are, evolve over time. Uh, they can't be static. Uh, I know it's, it may sound complicated because it's already taken a few years for, for Europe to have a, a first step of the taxonomy, so it may seem, you know, an even bigger challenge to say we need to change it every year. But literally, that's what we should do. We should make sure that they, you know, whichever taxonomy we use, it evolves over time to incorporate state-of-the-art knowledge uh, and and you know adjust uh, efforts depending on current pathways uh, towards achieving collective goals. Whether it's the, you know, the, the 1.5 degree trajectory of the Paris Agreement or the 2030 SDG um, gaps that are actually narrowing every year that passes. So, uh, yes, they need to be harmonized and they need to be evolving. And this is a challenge, yes. Uh, but um, and, and, but, but, but I'm, I'm quite confident that we may achieve that. If it's not achieved by regulation or uh, public bodies, then yes, they, they, uh, the, the, the market will, will definitely be there. Thank you, Karen. And Denisa? Very quickly to add, uh, I would just echo what uh, was already said. Uh, let's not try to uh, for perfection because that may take lifetime, which we don't have. I would say uh, two messages to add to that. Uh, reconcile really the transition ambition with the capacity of the economies. And one more aspect uh, from a global point of view, also ensure a consistency between ESG frameworks because we will have the International uh, Sustainability Standard Board for the for the disclosure. At uh, banking level, we have the NGFS, that's the Network for Cleaning Financial System, IOSCO for the for the market. If the concept differ, this will be very very difficult, um, you know, to to adopt globally. So a consistent global. Um, uh, ESG framework with proper governance, probably under the FSB uh, or the guidance of G20, uh, to foster the consistency and jurisdictional convergence. That would be uh, from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much, all. I think we are already reaching the closing. I would like just to say thank you very much for this great discussion and to the audience. I hope you enjoyed it. And just to say that you know this the taxonomy development is like creating a very big dictionary that needs to be constantly evolving, taking into account all of the different industries and that needs to be managed with this governance that Denisa was saying in order to make this uh, a tool capable of evolving properly. And da that Daniel, if I, is very big. <laughs> Thank you. Da Daniel, if I may just mention, uh, just in the interest of everybody, we, we have just published at uh, Natixis a, a um, a study called the Taxonomy's Navigation Compass, uh, which may be of interest because it really looks at all everything that exists as of today, and it's evolving almost okay. every day. But uh, yeah, it, it, this is where okay. you had very concrete information about the fifteen taxonomies all around. That's right. <laughs> okay, so th thank you very much. Please, everybody, I would then uh, encourage you to check this this uh, this publication from the Tixis, and thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoy the podcast. Un grand merci à nos intervenantes et à nos intervenants pour cette session. Il est essentiel de déterminer quelles réglementations mettre en place et comment les déployer si nous voulons rapidement harmoniser les pratiques afin que se matérialisent les changements concrets à plus grande échelle. 
thanks to the speakers. If we want to see actual change on a bigger scale, it's absolutely critical to determine what kind of regulation we want to see and how they're implemented.